In this video, I'm going to go through um, AQA A-level chemistry paper, that's 2018, uh, and it's uh, paper three. Okay, so I'll just do the first half of it, and I'll leave the multiple choice section uh, until another video. Right, okay, so uh, here's a question on rates of reaction. Now, this is, uh, don't forget, paper three uh, has a lot of the practical stuff on it, and this is actually relates to... Um, the iodine clock experiment, which one of the required practicals. So it's required practical um, seven, uh, required practical seven, seven A or seven B, if I remember. Okay, it's the iodine clock experiment. And they do ask a lot of, um, there's a lot of focus on required practicals in the, in this paper three. Okay, so the, here's the, um, the reaction. And so the rate is, there's a rate equation and so they're trying to find out the rate in order with respect to H plus. Um, okay, and if you use a large excess of hydrogen peroxide and I minus, the rate equation can be simplified to this. So uh, question one, explain why the use of a large excess of hydrogen peroxide and iodide means that the rate of reaction depends on only concentration of H plus. Well, if you've got a very large excess of these two, the concentration of H2O2 uh, and of I minus are going to be more or less constant. Uh, so they're going to, because they're constant, they're going to disappear from the rate equation. So they're, they're going to be effectively uh, zero order with respect to them. That's all you have to say there. Okay, so you can just focus on the effect of changing hydrogen ion concentration on the rate. All right, samples of the reaction mixture are removed. All right, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just copy that equation. Right, so you, uh, the samples of the reaction which are removed and titrate with alkali to determine the H plus concentration. Uh, state what must be done to each sample before it's titrated. Okay, well, th that reaction there, the reaction with the, is going to carry on. If you take a sample uh, out for titration, it's still going to carry on reactor with the hydrogen peroxide and the iodide. How do you stop that? Well, um, you can either cool it down, which wouldn't be terribly effective because it still carry on going. The best thing is to get rid, remove either the hydrogen peroxide or the iodide. Um, remove the hydrogen peroxide so the reaction has got to stop. Uh, uh, the hydrogen peroxide you can get rid of quite easily by adding a catalyst such as, you don't have to say which catalyst or you don't have to say how to get rid of it, but it is easy to get rid of. Add a bit of manganese dioxide, it will cause the hydrogen peroxide to decompose into water and oxygen very, very quickly. Or you could have the enzyme catalase, that does it very effectively as well. And that will stop the reaction. Okay, so there's a graph of the, of the results. So hydrogen, hydrogen ion concentration, how that changes with time. Now the question is, it says, explain how the graph shows the, the, uh, the, 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 the reaction is zero order with respect to H plus ions. Well, let's answer that. What is the, how do you get the rate from that graph? Well, the great rate of course is equal to the gradient or more specifically the minus the gradient actually because, yeah, okay. So the rate is the minus the gradient. That gradient is constant. Even though the, even though the concentration of hydrogen ions is decreasing. So it must be independent of hydrogen ions. Okay, so whenever you get a graph that looks like that, the reactant with time, and it's a straight line, it must be zero order. Most reactions tend to look like that, of course. You get a big drop, first of all, and then it gradually tails off. Um, and that's because if it wasn't zero order with respect to hydrogen ion, it would be fastest at the start, steep rate gradient there, because you've got a lot of hydrogen about. Okay. Right, uh, continue. Right, use the graph, 1.4, use the graph to calculate the value of K1 and give the unit to K1. Well, we've said here that uh, earlier on, K1 is when you've got a large excess of hydrogen peroxide and so you've got this equation rate 
is equal to K1 H plus. And that's when you've got a large excess of hydrogen peroxide and um, iodide. We know that's zero order, so put that in there. So that means that this is equal to one. So rate is actually equal to the, uh, the value of the rate constant, K1. Right, so we, we need to find out K1. So we find out the rate. How do we find out the rate from the gradient of this graph? So the gradient of that graph, I'm gonna do right. Let's take this big triangle here. So gradient is going to be equal to uh, changing the y, changing the x, changing the y, of course, is going to be 0 minus 0.5 divided by um, that's four, about 415 minus 0. That is equal to minus 0 0.00121 moles per decimeter cubed that is the for strictly speaking rate is equal to the minus the gradient so we can get rid of that minus sign so that would be the rate and that is also equal to k1 and the units are going to be moles oh sorry the unit should be moles per decimeter cubed per second that's the units of rate and it's going to be the same units for k1 as of rate because as we said Rate is just equal to K1 there. Okay, a uh, second reaction mixture is made at the same temperature. They change the, the concentrations of the iodide and the hydrogen peroxide. Uh, the iodide isn't, isn't in large excess here, but we do have a large excess of hydrogen peroxide. Okay, right. So the results are shown in the table. You've got to plot those in, in the graph. They'll give you a piece of graph. Oh, those in the first three, and they give you the axes. Right, I plotted them there. And then it says, calculate the rate of reaction when hydrogen ion concentration is equal to 0.35. So there's 0.35 there. That's the concentration. And we need to find out the rate at that point. So we draw a tangent to that curve. It's um, the red curve. It, it's definitely curved. You get your ruler. It's not a straight line. Um, and draw a tangent to it, the green line. And let's now work out the gradient and that will give us the rate. So the gradient of the tangent. So I'm going to use that big triangle there. That one. Okay, so gradient. M. Changing Y, changing X. Changing Y is naught minus 0.46, changing x is 1200 seconds minus zero. We work that out. Um, you get 3.92 times 10 to the minus five. And the units are going to be mole per decimeter cube per second because the changing concentration is mole per decimeter cubed and the time is second. Okay. Now, rate is strictly speaking the negative gradient. <clears throat> the, the gradient is a negative line, so rate is equal to just the positive value, 3.92 times 10 to the minus 5 moles per decimeter cubed per second. Okay, so move on. Right. A <clears throat> general reaction, equation for a reaction is shown below. Right, so you've got A, B, and C reacting to give you D and E. Now, I think a lot of people didn't realize initially, they did after a minute, that really what this reaction is talking about the iodine, we we're talking about the iodine clock experiment here. Okay, and it says all of the reactants and products are colorless except for E, which is dark blue. And of course, iodine is dark blue in the presence of starch. Not that that matters for answering the question, but it is. And it says a reagent X is available that rapidly reacts with E. Okay. Now that was actually thiosulfate in the required practice practical. Uh, sulfate ions, S2O3, 2 minus, that will react with iodine. Okay, so a small amount of X is included, and this will react with any E produced into all of, into all of the X's you've been used up. Okay, so right, explain giving brief experimental details. How do you use a series of experiments in order to determine the order of the reaction? 
But what you're going to do is you're going to wait for the mixture uh, to turn blue. And the mixture will turn blue when you've made enough E iodine to react with all of the X that is present there. So it's your timing how long it takes to form a certain amount of E effectively. That's what you're doing. Right. right. So you're going to measure the time taken. Now, how do you work out the rate from that? Well, rate is going to be proportional to one over the time. Quite often you you, you can say that rate then rather than using one, you can use a thousand over time because you easier numbers to work with. One over time is fine though. So that's what you're going to do. Brief experimental details. Well, we want to get a series of results. We want to have change, we want to have changed the concentration of A and find out rate, which we're going to work out by a thousand over time, the time taken to go cloudy. So if you're doing an experiment like this, how many different concentrations of A would you use? Well, I think most people would say let's use five different concentrations of A. When we're doing this, we must take care to ensure that the concentration of all the other things are the same. So concentration of B and C must be constant. And also, we must add the same amount of X to each of the five experiments. Okay, so we need to do those. So we're only changing the concentration of A. And I think it's probably worthwhile mentioning here, how would you actually achieve that? Well, you'd probably get stock solutions of A, of B, of C, and of X, okay? Now we wanna keep the concentrations of these three the same, the amount, so you, you keep the, the volume of B, C, and X, you keep the same. Uh, all we're going to do then is we are going to change the um, the volume of A for each of the five experiments. So you could use like one centimeter cubed in the first one, two centimeter cubed, three, four, and five. But then you'd have to be a little bit careful there because if you're changing the the volume of A, you're going to change the overall volume as well, which would change the concentration of B and C a bit. So what people normally do there is you also add H2O to each to each reaction mixture. And the one you are adding uh, five to, you add the volume of H2O. You add you don't add any H2O. Here you'd add when you're adding only adding four of A, you need to add one of H2O to keep the volume the same. This one you'd have to add two. There you'd have to add three and that one you'd have to add four centimeters cubed of h2o so it's probably worthwhile mentioning that that to keep the total volume the same you're going to change the amount of h2o but importantly you're going to keep the concentrations of b c and x all the same and only change a and then you're going to time how long it takes to go blue black and then do a thousand over time to get the rate from that that is exactly what you do in experiment seven required practical the iodine clock experiment Okay, so this one is not experimentally based. This one is to, um, it's about the, the, the periodic behavior of the oxides across period three, okay? Uh, so given the equation, two observations for reaction occurs when sodium is heated with oxygen. So the, uh, the observation is sodium burns with a yellow flame. And it leaves a white powder behind, which is the sodium oxide. The sodium oxide has got the formula Na2O, of course. So that means you're going to need 2Na plus a half O2. It's going to go to Na2, there's the equation. Right, the same thing when you heat phosphorus and oxygen. Well, phosphorus burns readily. It burns with the bright yellow flame. Uh, because it's pretty hot, the P4O10 produced is gaseous. So we're going to make P4O10. Phosphorus, ex uh, of course, exists as P4 
Um, you, if you wrote 4P, I think they let you, they allow that anyway, but I'm going to write the P4 solid, and you can do 502s, P4010 is the uh, is the product. All right, 2.3, those are the oxides of the elements sodium to sulfur is shown below. So the highest, the reason why it says highest oxides there is because of course sulfur can form SO2 or SO3. And we're talking about the highest one, so SO3 there. Okay, the increase in melting points from sodium oxide to magnesium oxide. Well, I think we need to mention what kind of bonding we've got in both of those. We've got ionic bonding in both of those things. For sodium oxide, you've got Na plus two sodium ions and one oxide ion. Uh, in magnesium, you've got Mg2 plus and oxide ion. Right, why is sodium, why has magnesium got a higher melting point? It's because you have a double positive charge on the magnesium uh, ion compared to the sodium, which is only one positive. So there is a stronger uh, electrostatic attraction to the oxide ion. So you're going to need more energy to break down the lattice. Okay, uh, you might also want to mention that the Mg2 plus ion, even though the sodium ion and the, um, the magnesium ion have the same electronic configuration, both 2A, uh, this is smaller, of course, because magnesium has got a nuclear charge of plus 12, the sodium has only got 11 protons, so it doesn't hold the electrons in as tightly. So not only is the magnesium smaller, um, sorry, more highly charged, it's also smaller, so it's got a higher charge density. That's probably a bit over the top to write all that down for two marks, though, but that is true, nevertheless. Right, explain why the melting point of the oxide of silicon is much higher than that of phosphorus. Well, SiO2, if you remember from GCSE even, is a giant covalent structure. So that means you need to break covalent bonds in order to melt it. When you melt it, which of course is very strong. Whereas P4O10 is simple molecular. By the way, look at the mark scheme. They don't like the term simple covalent. Don't know why, but they don't. They won't let you have it. So let's keep AQA happy and not write simple covalent. Um, uh, P4O10 is simple molecular, so there you're only going to have to break into molecular forces when you when you um, when you melt it. Right. Right. Now here is another one. This this question number three. This relates to required practical five. I think it is five B. Uh, when you dehydrate cyclohexanol to make cyclohexene. Okay, so this is a direct lift from that required practical. Okay, so it's worthwhile revising those. Um, student prepared cyclohexane by placing 10 centimeters cubed cyclohexanol in a, uh, in a round bottom flask, and they add some concentrated phosphoric acid, that's the catalyst to dehydrate it, and um, added a few anti-bumping granules and the apparatus shown below. Right, there's the apparatus. Right, now calculate the percentage yield of cyclohexane. So if you're going to just, they give, you, we say we've got 5.97. Right, so if we just write the equation, uh, one mole of cyclohexanol gives you one mole of cyclohexene. I'll just write down the molecular weights of those things. So. Uh, the MR of cyclohexanol, oh, well, that's going to be C6H12O. So the MR is exactly 100. That loses a water molecule, so it's going to be 18 less. So the MR of that is 82. Right. That told us the density of cyclohexanol was 0.96 gram per decimeter cubed. And we started off with 10 centimeters cubed of cyclohexanol. So the mass of cyclohexanol is going to be density times the volume. So that's 0.96 times 10 
is equal to 9.6 grams. So we need to work out how many moles of cyclohexane, cyclohexanol we've got there. Okay, so moles of the cyclohexanol, mass over MR, 9.6 over 100. So that's equal to 0 0.096 moles. So if you get 100% yield then, so we've got a one-to-one, one, one mole of this gives us one mole of the hexene. So we should get 100% yield, we should get 0.96 of the cyclohexene. 0 0.96. So um, let's work out the mass of cyclohexene is equal to moles times MR. So that's 0 0.096. The MR of the other one was 82, you said. So that means the mass you're going to get there is going to be um, 7.872, you should get. So now all we've got to do is work out the percentage yield. So expected over obtained. Expected over actual times 100. We, uh, sorry, the actual over the expected, beg your pardon. Uh, so we actually got um, 5.97, it says, there, uh, divided by the amount we expect, which is that multiplied by 100 is equal to 75.8% yield. Okay, so back to that. Right, describe its test tube reaction on the product to show that the cyclohexanol had been dehydrated. Okay, so you're testing uh, on the, um, you, you, you basically test, you're testing for the presence of a double bond. And of course that in GCSE is bromine water and it should be decolorized. So it goes from red to colorless. Don't say it goes clear because uh, that's not, it's the, it's the losing the color that matters. Okay, why was sodium carbonate used to wash the distillate? Well, you, um, you had some phosphoric acid in there and some of that might distill over. It's got a fairly high boiling point, but some of it might distill over. So um, you would have to um, add the sodium carbonate to neutralize that. To get rid of the phosphoric acid. Okay, so you would react with the hydrogen ions and the phosphoric acid, would react with the carbonate ions to make CO2, and you'd be left with phosphate ions behind, yeah, and water. Okay, you get rid of the phosphoric acid. Right, explain why it's important to open the tap of the separating funnel. So what you, you just to remind you what a separating funnel is, it's uh, like that. And you have a stopper in there. And what you do is you, um, that would be your aqueous layer. So this is you washing it with um, sodium carbonate in, in water. That's going to be heavier, so that's sink to the bottom. This is going to be your cyclohexene layer on the top. Um, <clears throat> you shake it all up, and of course, you're going to get some CO2 generated. Normally, you turn it, you turn when you're shaking it, you turn it upside down, and you would, it's got a stopper in there, so it doesn't all fall out, and you open the tap to release uh, the CO2, which has been made during the neutralization of sodium carbonate. That's why you do that. Uh, give a property of calcium and hydrous calcium carbonate, other than its ability to absorb water, that makes it suit as a drying agent. Um, they ask this question periodically, and it's just all you've got to say is uh, you've got to choose a drying agent that doesn't react, it does not react uh, with the product. It's fairly unreactive, it doesn't react with cyclohexene. Obviously, it wouldn't be any good at all if it did. 
uh, just a one more question that comes up periodically, just like what what's the point of anti-bumping granules? And we will always say to stop large bubbles forming during boiling is a kind of standard answer. Right. Um, now here, describe the apparatus you would use to remove the drying agent by filter so the drying agent is calcium chloride by under reduced pressure. Um, I would probably it says you draw a label diagram, so I would probably do. So you have this, which is filtering under pressure. This is a fairly standard question as well. So you have this, it's called a Buckner funnel. Uh, and I usually uh, attach that to a vacuum pump. So you don't have to include any details of the vacuum pump. And I usually be careful when you draw this, right? So here you've got your bung, and there you've got your funnel which actually goes through it. This is a Buckner funnel. So label that. Uh, and here you need to have a piece of filter paper in the Buckner funnel as well. And um, they are quite picky about, you see here, that's all going to be sealed in. You, uh, and also you've got to have, if you draw your, your bung like that solid, then they won't give you the marks for it. Okay, they don't like that. You've got to have like cross-sectional things so you can see the tube going through the bung Right, 3.7, a sample of cyclohexene has been contaminated with cyclohexanol. Uh, can, can be separated by column chromatography. Silica gel is used in the stationary phase and hexane is a mobile phase. Well, silica gel contains SiO2, which has got oxygens in it. So it's uh, polar, it's, it's polar. And so that means um, cyclohexanol Will, will interact with it better than the hexene, which of course is not polar. Uh, the cyclohexanol is polar because you've got the OH group on it. Uh, you don't have to go into any more detail of that, it's only two marks. All right. Now, uh, explain how infrared could confirm that the cyclohexene obtained did not contain any cyclohexanol. Right, so here is our uh, AQA infrared data off the data sheet. Now, if you've got cyclohexanol there, you would have this OH group in there, and that means you would get an absorbance around there. And I've included that, this little diagram here, because it's extremely easy to spot an alcohol in an infrared spectra. You get this peak here, that's the alcohol, and it's always really easy to spot because it's next door to this peak here, which is due to the CHS. So you get that double peak, very characteristic of the OH of an alcohol. Uh, you wouldn't see that if it was pure cyclohexene. It would just be like that, wouldn't it? You get the CHS still, but you wouldn't get that. And then you'd get a little tiny peak there as well for the for the uh, for that there. But the main thing to say is you know, it's only one mark, so you would not get an absorbance in that region. Right. Okay. Question four. Right. Now this again is another required practical. This is required practical two. A calorimetry experiment. Um, I think the, the actual required practical two is when you add anhydrous copper sulfate to water. Well, here you're adding sodium hydroxide. It's not quite the same, but it's effectively the same sort of thing. Okay. So uh, the student measuring cylinder places some um, hydrochloric acid in the in a glass beaker. Now that's important because you know, of course, you wouldn't do it in a glass beaker. You would do it in a polystyrene beaker. And there's a question on that later. And um, that's because it's a better insulator than glass, so the heat would stay in there. Recorded the temperature at one minute intervals for three minutes. At the fourth minute, you add the sodium hydroxide. Of course, you've got to draw this graph on the left, which I've already drawn. And the student recorded the temperature at one minute intervals for a further eight minutes. There's his results. And you have to, and the question is, plot a graph on the grid up to the left. 
use your graph to find out the temperature rise of the fourth minute. Show you're working on the graph by drawing suitable lines of best fit. Okay, so what I have done, I've plotted my, I've chosen that scale there. So temperature degrees C, uh, time and minutes on the bottom. Um, and then uh, the green crosses are the points I've plotted. Okay, right, so you can see before here, down here, this is before you've added any uh, of the sodium hydroxide. At four minutes, you add the, the sodium hydroxide um, and the temperature goes up. So at this point, the reaction hasn't finished uh, and it has finished at that point. And then all in this part of the curve, the reason why the temperature is dropping is because it's an exothermic reaction and the solution is gradually cooling, it's losing heat to the environment and cooling back down to room temperature. Uh, and so what we do is we extrapolate this line backwards and say, look, we added the uh, we added the sodium hydroxide at four minutes. There, so we're going to plot that red line backwards to find out that the temperature it would have been at four minutes if it had reacted instantaneously before it lost any heat. So we're going to use this to find delta T. So you have to simply find out the difference between that there and the, uh, the startup temperature. So I've drawn, I've drawn, I've plotted two lines here. I've extrapolated this one forwards and, and the red one I've extrapolated backwards. Del delta T is gonna be equal to 21.8 minus 19.8, all right. Sorry, four minutes, I'm not quite right there. Well, that's five minutes, four minutes. It should be there. So you're saying that that's the temperature it would have been uh, when you added the stuff at four minutes. So that's 21.9. 21.9 minus 19.8. So the temperature rise is 2.1 degrees Celsius. Okay, so plotting those graphs, that's a, you know, uh, a skill which is in required practical two. And that's what they're testing there. Okay, right, 4.2. The uncertainty of each of the temperature readings, oh, right, uh, was point, plus or minus 0.1 degrees C. Calculate the percentage uncertainty in the value. So that's, well, that's gonna be 0.1, that's the uncertainty over the total temperature rises, 2.1, multiplied by 100. So that is gonna be, Okay. Point zero, so that's gonna be 4.7, so 4.8%, 4.76%, which is quite a lot, okay. Suggest to change the experiment that would minimize heat loss. Well, what you wanna do is you wanna make this temperature rise bigger. You want that to be bigger. How can you make it bigger? Well, you can't just add more, a bigger volume of solution because then you've got, you know, you, you, you're heating up more solution. So you have to make the reagents more concentrated. So use more concentrated uh, NaOH and HCl. So then you're gonna have a bigger number of moles reacting. Uh, so you get a bigger amount of heat released, uh, bigger temperature rise. Uh, suggest and explain another change that would decrease the percentage and uh, oh sorry <laughs> that's the wrong question that's that's the question there suggest and explain that another change to the experiment would decrease the percentage uncertainty in the use of the thermometer use more concentrated NaOH and HCl and this one to minimize heat loss sorry all you have to do there is use the polystyrene cup instead of a glass beaker getting a bit ahead of myself there. Right, 4.5. Right, a second student completes an experiment, the entropy of neutralization of ethan dioic acid and potassium hydroxide. Right, first of all, I'm gonna jump here. It says, give an equation for the reaction. Well, ethan dioic acid has got two carboxylic acids and each of those is gonna react with an OH minus. Okay, so the equation is gonna be ethan dioic, which is, uh, I'm going to write it like this, I think. I'm going to write it as H2C2O4. 
H2C204, and that is going to react with KOH. Right, that is going to give us the it's going to give us the ethan dioate ion. So it loses two protons. It loses that proton and that one. So that's all right. That, and I've got two uh, K plus ions. I'm going to make two waters. Okay, so I should really write that as write it like that. Okay, so that is the equation there. Right, now, uh, calculate the enthalpy change per mole of water formed in this reaction. Okay, so we're gonna use two equations here. We're gonna use Q is equal to MC delta T. And we're gonna use delta H is divided by Q over the moles of H2O formed. So we're going to have to have a look at the number of moles of H2O form we've got. Right, first of all, let's see how much ethane dioic acid we've got. So concentration times the volume. Uh, ethane dioic acid, you're going to have uh, 0 0.025 multiplied by 0 0.8, which gives you um, 0 0.02 moles of ethane dioic acid. Write that down there. Uh, the moles of potassium hydroxide, oh, that's going to be 75. Do that in yellow. 75 over 1,000, concentration times volume, multiplied by 0 .06, 0 0.6. So that's going to be equal to um, 0 0.045. So we've got 0 0.045 of that. So that's in excess. And of course, the only really only 0 0.04 of that is actually going to react. Um, now, if we have 0 0.02 moles of that, we're going to form 0 0.04 moles of water. So that's how much water we're forming in this. So we have to remember that. Okay, so let's do Q is equal to MC delta T. Right, so Q is equal to... Now, again, we have to be a bit careful because we have got 25 centimeters cubed of ethan dioate and 75 of that and that makes 100 centimeters cubed altogether the density is one gram per centimeter cubed so m is 100 here Be careful, don't forget that so m is 100 the specific heat capacity of water is 4.2 uh, and the change in temperature is 3.2 so that's going to be equal to Uh, 1,344 joules. Now to work out delta H for that. Well, delta H is equal to Q over the moles H2O. So 1344 divided by the moles of H2O, which is 0 which is 33,600 joules. Sorry, 33,600 joules. Let's turn that to kilojoules, 33.6 kilojoules. And don't forget, I think you lose a mark if you don't put this down. It's minus because it is an exothermic reaction because the temperature goes up. And so you do all that work and you will lose about a fifth of the marks if you forget to put your minus in there. Okay, so that's the answer to that question. Now, here it says, in a similar neutralization experiment and reaction, okay, you react sulfuric acid this time, instead of ethane dioic acid, with potassium hydroxide. So it's going to be a very similar reaction. You need 2 KOH. Oh, did I put my 2 KOH? I didn't. Uh, in this, I need to balance that equation properly. Yeah, 2 KOH uh, to give you potassium sulfate and water. 
And of course, really what you're doing there, the, the potassium ions and the sulfate ions, the spectator ions, and in both reactions, you only react, you're just reacting H plus ions with OH minus ions to form water. So the question says is, um, why do you get a difference in the values? Okay, between sulfuric acid and your answer to question ethan dioic acid when in each case it's just the hydrogen ions reacting with the oh minus ions well it's because sulfuric acid of course is a strong acid so it is already completely dissociated whereas ethane dioic acid is a weak acid so only a small proportion of that will actually be a tiny proportion of it will be that because it's a dibasic weak acid uh, and so what you have to do first of all before the H plus and the OH minus can react to release the energy exothermic, you need to break that bond there, uh, which of course is going to require energy. Okay, and that's the answer there. Right, that is the end of section A, and I will do section B in a separate video.